you hear me? Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to this um, uh, wonderful meeting. And um, so, as you all know, this meeting is about thermalization, many body localization, and hydrodynamics. My talk is actually not going to be about any of these three things. Um, it is going to be about localization, but single particle localization. And you might wonder um, what the interest is in single particle localization now that many body localization has really cornered the market on this thing. Um, so I try to convince you here that uh, there are interesting questions about single particle localization, especially in this class of systems called quasi-periodic systems. So that's what I'll be talking about. Um, the work that I'll be talking about has been done mainly by Jagannath Sutsudhar, who's um, a PhD student and in the audience. And it's been done in collaboration with my colleagues Rahul Pandit and Sumilan Banerjee uh, at the Department of Physics in IISC. And this is the reference um, where the work, uh, where you can read more about the work. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk about single particle localization. And the kind of single particle localization that is most familiar is Anderson localization, where the system in question is described by this kind of Hamiltonian. So you have a Hamiltonian, a single particle Hamiltonian, uh, uh, a particle that's, let's say, um, in a lattice with some particular kind of hopping profile. And you also have on-site disorder. So these epsilon j's are disorder variables. So they're random variables typically assumed to be uncorrelated and drawn from the same uh, distribution. Um, so this is, so what you have then is a single particle potential which looks random. So this is uh, sort of a schematic representation of that. And what we know is that when you look at the, the eigenstates of the single particle in uh, a potential like this, you essentially have two possibilities. You can either have extended states where uh, the amplitude of finding the particle at any particular point in the lattice does not decay away from any other point. Or you can have localized states where you actually have a decaying wave function or a decaying amplitude about some state. And so what happens, and you know, this is a situation in three dimensions, is that as a function of something, typically the disorder strength, um, you can actually effect a transition between um, a system with only localized states to one which has extended and localized states. So there is a critical point, there's a metal insulator transition. And so um, on the extended side, you have a diffusive metal. So if you look at the conductance of the system, the electrical conductance, as a function of system size, it obeys Ohm's law and it varies like this, where D is the dimensionality of the system. And on the localized side, you have a localized system, so you have a conductance which actually decreases exponentially with system size. And um, so this is sort of, in a nutshell, a summary of what we know about Anderson localization when the disorder potential is random. So uh, <clears throat> a proper understanding of this transition was actually provided about 40 years ago by uh, Abrams et al., uh, the so-called Gang of Four in the seminal paper. And what they did was the following. So what they said was that in the two limits, in the limit of um, localization and in the limit of you know, completely extended states, we know what the conductance does. So in one case, we have Ohm's law. In the other case, we have something which is exponentially small in the system size. Okay? And in both of these regimes, the change of conductance with the system size, this particular quantity, the so-called beta function of the conductance, depends only on the value of the conductance, okay? And so on the extended side, it um, is a constant, and the value of the constant depends on the dimensionality. On the localized side, of course, it is not a constant. It, it, it falls off in this particular way. And so we know that, um, that we know what the behavior of this beta function is for small value, very small values of conductance where you expect localization, and very large values of conductance where you expect this kind of metallic uh, ohmic behavior. And so what they assumed was that in between, if you look at beta as a function of g, in between as well, for intermediate values of conductance, once again, beta is a function of g, and it is a continuous and monotonic function which interpolates between these two kinds of behavior. So with this assumption, 
what you can see is that in three dimensions you actually have a metal insulator transition because there is a particular value of g at which the beta function crosses zero. So if you happen to be on one side of this, uh, let's say on the higher side, and you go to larger and larger system sizes, your conductance is going to flow because the beta function is positive to the ohmic value. On the other side, because um, you have a beta function which is negative, if you start from some value of g and then increase the system size, go to larger and larger system sizes, then you're going to flow to the localized, um, you <clears throat> towards the localized side. And so you have a metal insulator transition. But in less than three dimensions, in two dimensions, in, in, sorry, in less than two dimensions, you don't have this behavior because the beta function is always negative. So you're going to flow to the localized side and there is no metal insulator transition, okay? So this is the, you know, so this is sort of, again, a summary of the statement that all states are localized in 1D and 2D. You only have the localized phase. You don't have the diffusive conducting phase. And the critical point, and you have a critical point with the scale invariance, invariant conductance in three dimensions. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about is a different kind of single particle system where the single particle potential is not a disorder potential, but is a quasi-periodic potential. So once again, there's a Hamiltonian which has a form that is similar to the one that I showed you with uh, an on-site potential. The only difference now is that the on-site potential is not a random variable. It's actually something which has a specific form, and the form is this. So it has a strength, and then it has a dependence on the site index j in this particular way. And alpha here, this number, is irrational, okay? So what this shows is that, so an irrational alpha assures that the potential doesn't ever repeat itself, okay? So it is not commensurate with the lattice. And so you have a non-repeating potential, which is similar to what you have in the disorder case, because in the disorder case, when you draw these potentials from a random distribution, it is again, essentially a probability zero event that your potential is going to repeat itself. However, there is, of course, a big difference between this kind of potential and having true disorder. And the difference is that this is completely deterministic, whereas a disorder potential is, is completely non-deterministic. So what I mean by that is here, if you know the value of the potential at some particular side j, and you know the form of the potential, you essentially know the value of the potential at every other side j. It doesn't repeat, but it's completely deterministic. And for a true disordered potential, that is not the case. So that's a difference. Okay, so why is this interesting? So the, the reason that this is interesting is that it is, so this particular model that I showed you uh, in the previous slide has a name, it's called the Aubrey-Andre model. And in this model, there's a specific assumption that the hopping, so this is a one-dimensional model, so now I'm focusing on 1D, and there's the assumption that the hopping is just nearest neighbor. So this particular model has been pretty well studied again for about the last 40 years, and it has some pretty interesting properties. So even though it's a one-dimensional model, it doesn't have the property that all states are localized. In fact, what happens is that depending on the value of the strength of the um, quasi-periodic potential, you either have all states being completely delocalized or all states being completely localized, and there is a transition at a particular value of the quasi-periodic potential between this kind of behavior and that kind of behavior. So you either, so if you look at the single particle spectrum, you either have all states completely delocalized or all states completely localized and a critical point in between. And if you look at the single particle states at the critical point, then the single particle states display a particular kind of self-similar behavior, which is quite similar to the self-similar fractal behavior that you have for the wave functions at the critical point for the regular Anderson transition. So there's something uh, in common there, but this is the important thing that you actually have this even in 1D. Further, if you were to look at the delocalized states and look at transport in the delocalized states, unlike <clears throat> in the case of the Anderson model in three dimensions, where transport in the delocalized states is diffusive, here it turns out that the transport is actually ballistic. So you have ballistic transport in the delocalized states, and of course the localized states give you localized transport. And the reason that we know so much about this model is that there's actually a nice duality between momentum space and real space in this model. There's a duality transformation, which you can also use to argue that there is a critical point, which is a self-dual point, and you can calculate various properties associated with this critical point. 
Okay, so since this is, since many body localization is one of the themes of this conference, I thought that I'd maybe say um, a little bit about it, even though uh, in, the, in the context of quasi-periodic potentials, even though that's not what I'm going to be talking about. So as many of you know, uh, the cleanest experimental realization of many body localization uh, is, has been in a system of cold atoms, okay? And so this was done um, about four years ago. And the particular potential that was used in this experiment was actually a quasi-periodic potential and not true disorder because it turned out that the experimental apparatus that was being used was such that this kind of potential could be realized more easily than true disorder. So our cleanest observation of many body localization has actually been in a system with a quasi-periodic potential and not with uh, true disorder. And prior to the experiment, it was of course shown that a system with this kind of quasi-periodic potential would display many body localization, just like a system with uh, disorder growth. And I say just like, I mean, uh, at a qualitative level, but there are differences, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about uh, in, in the next couple of weeks of this uh, workshop. So I should mention that another interesting thing that uh, a quasi-periodic potential can do for you in one dimension is that it can actually produce a single particle mobility edge, okay? So the Aubrey-Andre model, which I was talking about earlier, does not have a mobility edge, meaning depending on which phase you're in, either all your single particle states are delocalized or all of them are localized. You do not have an energy which separates localized and delocalized single particle states. But it turns out that the Aubrey-Andre model is actually rather fine-tuned because of the duality that I talked about. If you break the duality in the Aubrey-Andre model, then the generic situation is that you actually have a mobility edge. You do not have all particles localized or all particles delocalized. And then it's an interesting question to ask whether if you add interactions to a system like that with a single particle mobility edge, what happens? I mean, do you have ergodicity? Do you not have ergodicity? And so it turns out that even though you might naively think that having delocalized single particle delocalized states can effectively provide some kind of a thermal bath, um, and could cause the system to thermalize when you add interactions. It turns out that that isn't the case. And so there were theoretical arguments in favor of that and numerical calculations. And very recently, it, this has also been observed experimentally that you know, when you have a system like this with a quasi-periodic potential and a single particle mobility edge and you turn on interactions, there actually seems to be a lack of ergodicity in the system. And so you do have many body localization or some form of non-ergodicity in these systems and that has now been experimentally established. Um, one of the interesting uh, corollaries of this is that in these systems with single particle mobility edges, there is the possibility of having something that you know, goes by many different names, one of which is a non-ergodic metal. So we have a many body localized phase in which you have uh, states which are non-ergodic and also localized in the sense that if you look at the entanglement, the entanglement is areolar, and they're not ergodic in the sense that if you look for, um, say, <clears throat> the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis holding in these states, you will find that it doesn't, it's violated. On the other hand, on the thermal side, you say that the, the states actually do obey the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, and they have volume law entanglement. So it turns out that in these systems, you can actually have a window of many body energy eigenstates, which are a combination of the two kinds of behavior, in the sense that they're delocalized. Uh, so you actually have volume law entanglement, but you have a strong violation of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So, um, so this is still, you know, something that's speculative, and there are also experiments going on to try to observe this phase. But this is a particular phase which can occur in, in these systems, and it goes, you know, one of the names that it goes by is a non-ergodic metal. Metal because it's a delocalized phase, non-ergodic because uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is violated in, um, the, in these states. Okay. So the model that I showed you, so that's all I'm going to say about interacting systems. So let's come back to the non-interacting system. So the model that I showed you was a one-dimensional model, the Aubrey-Andre model. Now, it turns out that there are actually higher dimensional generalizations of this model. And so in particular, one that's been studied uh, over the last couple of years in three dimensions. Um, so this model, again, is a quasi-periodic model, but it's in three dimensions. So it has the feature that the potential doesn't repeat itself. And it also has, and it's also constructed in such a way that it has a duality which is very similar to the duality of the 1D Aubrey-Andre model. 
So it makes it, in some sense, analytically tractable in the same sense that the 1D model is. And so its phase diagram is something that has been worked out. And it turns out that unlike the 1D Aubrey-Andre model, this actually has three phases. So there's a ballistic phase in which you have all single particle states which are localized, sorry, um, uh, ballistic and delocalized. And it, of course, has a localized phase in which all your single particle states are localized. But then there's also something in between which is a diffusive phase, okay? So which is missing in the one-dimensional system. And so now you have in this um, localization, delocalization transitions, uh, a localization, delocalization transition going from the localized phase to the diffusive phase. But then you also have a transition going from the diffusive phase to the ballistic phase, which is like a metal to metal transition. And the duality of the model tells you that both of these transitions have to be in the same universality class. And it was shown here on the basis of a certain kind of analysis of the wave functions that the universality class of this transition is the same, at least in terms of measuring the localization length critical exponent, is the same as <clears throat> the one that you see in the regular Anderson transition. So even though this is a quasi-periodic model, uh, the universality class, at least as far as indicated by the localization length exponent, seems to be um, of the Anderson type. Okay. So with this sort of uh, introduction, let me now get to what we have been looking at. So here are some of the questions that you can ask about quasi-periodic systems. So since quasi-periodic systems also have their own kind of metal insulator transition, you can ask whether there is something like single, para single parameter scaling theory for quasi-periodic systems um, for the metal insulator transition. And if that were to be the case, then of course you need to have a smooth beta function. You would need to be able to A, talk about a beta function, how the conductance varies as a function of system size, and also argue that it depends only on the conductance. So is there a well-defined smooth beta function like uh, in the case of true disorder? And then, of course, there's this important question of what the nature of transport is at the critical point, at the transition. And so you have this entire gamut of possibilities in principle. It could be ballistic, super diffusive, diffusive, subdiffusive. So which one is it? Um, as far as the 1D Aubrey-Andre model is concerned at the critical point, um, so there is work, work which was actually done here at ICTS which shows that if you were to look at high temperatures in an open system, to so take the Aubrey-Andre model at the critical point connected to leads, look at a high temperature, then you find the transport is subdiffusive. Um, so you can ask, well, you know, what happens when you have a slightly different geometry? Um, does it continue to remain subdiffusive? What does the transport look like if it's energy resolved? And of course, what happens in higher dimensions? And then there's this question about whether observing the same critical, uh, observing the same correlation length exponent in 3D for the quasi-periodic model as for the Anderson model, does that automatically mean that there is single parameter scaling? Okay, so that's the question. Um, so what I'm going to do in the remainder of my talk is address these questions. So that's, you know, that's what we have done. So this schematically is essentially what we are asking again. So is there, um, uh, a single parameter scaling, uh, a theory like the gang of four theory for these quasi-periodic systems. So we know what's happening in one limit, which is the ballistic limit, as opposed to the diffusive limit, and this is the localized limit. So what happens in between? So once again, there's a beta function along the y-axis and a conductance along the x-axis. So what is the correct flow diagram for these quasi-periodic systems? So what we've done is we've actually looked at this problem numerically. So we've done numerical exact diagonalization on these models, um, calculated the conductance. And when I say conductance, we've looked at two different kinds of conductance. So there are two different types of conductance that you can define. Um, something called the Thaulus conductance, which is a closed system conductance. So here in this, when you're calculating or measuring this quantity, you don't connect any leads to the system. It's actually a closed system. And what you do is you change the boundary conditions of the system, which you can think of as threading magnetic flux. And then you look at how the energy levels shift when you go from having periodic to anti-periodic boundary conditions, what that, how, <clears throat> how that shift compares to the mean level spacing. And it turns out that you can actually define a notion of conductance by looking at this ratio. So this is one kind of conductance. And then there's another kind of conductance, which is sort of the more conventional thing, where you connect leads to the system, and you look at transmission from one lead to another lead. And that in 1D is what's called the Landauer conductance. And in higher dimensions, the equivalent is something called the Kubo conductance, um, for which you, know, you have a formula in terms of the current current correlation function and the Green's function. 
So these are the two conductances that we have calculated for the system, and I'll show you results for both of them, and compare and contrast what we see uh, for both of them in the context of the single parameter scaling that we're looking for. Okay, so yeah. Well, okay, in, it's actually related to just two different values of flux. I mean, so you have phi equal to zero and phi equal to pi, and then you look at how the energy levels of the system are changing when you change the boundary conditions. So, the, so it's something like this, that if you have localized states, then what should happen is that the change in energy, this delta E, should be rather small because the localized state shouldn't care about what you're doing to the boundary. Whereas if you have delocalized states, then this shouldn't be small, I mean, compared to the mean level spacing. So when you're calculating this, you're not really, you know, switching on a time-dependent flux and then looking at a current or something. You're just looking at two different boundary conditions and uh, how delta, how the, how the energies change. Okay. So, um, all right. So here are some numerical results. So this is in 1D for the Aubrey-Andre model. So what we've done is we have calculated the conductance. So L here stands for Landauer, and T here stands for Thaulus. And so even for quasi-periodic systems, there is an analog of averaging over disorder. So what you can do is you can actually put in a phase here in, in inside this potential function. And then so this phase tells you how your lattice is shifted relative to this cosine function. And you can think of this different values of phi is different realizations of disorder and average over this. So these are all disorder averaged values of the conductance. And um, for those of you who are experts in this, the particular conductance that I'm looking at is what's called the typical conductance and not the average conductance. So these are typical conductance values. So L stands for Landauer and T stands for Thaulus. So the transition is at V equal to one. And so what we have here are two values of V, V, one just less than one and the other just above one. So one just below the transition, one above the transition. And so by below, I mean um, when you have, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, ballistic transport. So, so, th so those correspond to these. So um, V less than one corresponds to these curves where you have ballistic transport. And so in 1D, your conductance is independent of L, right? Whereas when V is greater than one, you have the localized phase. And so you can see that log G actually changes linearly with L, which is consistent with having a localized phase. But what is interesting is that you actually have fluctuations um, in, 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 in this uh, conductance as a function of system size. So you have these peaks, okay? And you see these uh, peaks most pronounced in the Thaulus conductance rather than in the Landauer conductance. So it turns out that the Landauer and the Thaulus conductance actually have a relation in this regime. One is the square of the other. But the main thing is that you actually have some structure in this conductance as seen mainly in the Thaulus conductance as a function of system size. Okay, so that is there in the inset. Um, so, so you also see that on the metallic side, so you see some oscillations uh, over an L independent value, okay? And here you see some oscillations or fluctuations over an exponential decay. But the thing is that the Thaulus conductance oscillates more than the Landauer conductance, and there's this relation between them. Okay, now the interesting thing is that if you look at the critical point, then there is, um, you of course see these fluctuations, but then you also see a pattern in these fluctuations. So depending on what the particular sequence is of system sizes that you choose, you can actually get different power laws for the way in which the Thaulus conductance behaves as a function of system size. So if you say that the Thaulus conductance at the critical point is L to the power of some alpha, okay, then it turns out that you get different alphas depending on what sequence of Ls you choose. And the particular sequences, and so you can see that you can also get these peaks here in um, GT in the Thaulus conductance of the function of L. And if you ask, well, at what system sizes do you see these peaks? So it turns out that the sequence of peaks and the also sub peaks are located at Fibonacci lengths. Now, where do Fibonacci lengths come into this? So the reason that Fibonacci lengths enter here is that we've chosen a particular value of the irrational number in the potential. And it turns out that that particular value of the irrational number is a golden mean, which is the ratio of uh, Fibonacci lengths in the thermodynamic limit. 
So there is a particular way in which you can think of the duality now for this value of the irrational number uh, in this model. And it turns out that that gives you the structure of peaks. But the important thing is that this alpha exponent is actually different on average. So if you draw some average line here, ignoring the peaks, and for sequence of peak lengths. Okay? So depending on what the particular sequence is that you're looking at, you can actually get a different exponent. And it turns out that that exponent that you get can also depend on the energy that you're looking at. So remember that this is the Saulus conductance um, that uh, we are looking at. So we can, you know, it's a closed system conductance. And so we can uh, look at this at some particular energy. We can also do that for the Landau conductance. And so the alpha that we get turns out to also be dependent on the energy. Okay, so this alpha has a dependence on the peak structure. It has a dependence on the energy. And so one way of getting more information about this is to basically do, so you have, so what this is saying is that you have different alpha exponents at the critical point. So if you're looking at g as a function of l, you don't have one single exponent, you actually have a zoo of exponents. And one way of trying to quantify that, you know, the spread of exponents, if you like, is by doing a multifractal analysis. So here what we've done is we've, so we think of the conductance now, g as a function of l, the way in which you would think of a time-dependent signal as a function of time. So you actually think of this g as a function of l as a time series. Think of l as time. And then you can look at different blocks of length or different blocks of time and ask what is the variation of g within those blocks. And from that, you can actually do a multifractal analysis and get what's called a singularity spectrum. Now, the important thing here is that the wider the singularity spectrum is, the larger is the spread of these exponents. And so you have a pretty wide singularity spectrum exactly at the critical point. But then from the critical point, as you go into the ballistic phase, this becomes narrower and narrower. And so the spread of these exponents becomes smaller and smaller. And of course, eventually, you know, you just converge to just the ballistic exponent, uh, a equal to 1. <clears throat> and you go far away from the critical point. On the other side, it's a little difficult to do this analysis because G of L is decaying exponentially with system size. So you can't really do this analysis uh, very efficiently. So the important message here is that there is actually a lot of structure at the critical point. You have a whole zoo of exponents and a nice multifractal structure for the conductance as a function of system size. Okay. Um, so, so something like this is absent at the Anderson critical point in 3D. So if you were to try to do something like this at the Anderson critical point, you actually do not see this behavior in the conductance. So the other thing is if you calculate the beta function now. Uh, so this is the beta function as a function of, you know, we've done it both for Saulus and for Landauer, and ask the single parameter scaling hold. So you can see that beta as a function of g in both cases seems to be a nice function, monotonic function of g, as long as you are in the localized phase. And also when you go to the ballistic phase, you seem to have, you know, you have a crowding of points here, but beta of g essentially being flat, consistent with uh, ballistic transport and single parameter scaling. But at the critical point, you have a strong violation of single parameter scaling. There isn't a single point beta of g uh, for a given g. I mean, there isn't a single g at the transition. You actually have this, you know, the, these, this range of g's uh, at the transition, which tells you that you don't have single parameter scaling anymore. So you have a strong violation of single parameter scaling at the critical point, at the transition, but away from it, especially on the insulating side, it seems to be um, consistent with single parameter scaling. Okay, so that was a 1D model. So in the remaining uh, five minutes or so that I have, let me just tell you about the higher dimensional models. So it turns out that you can generalize this Aubrey-Andre model to higher dimensions. Um, so it's not just a simple question of introducing one irrational number for every direction. You have to be a little careful about the potential not repeating along any direction, not just along your x, y, and z axes. So for that, you need to um, introduce the, the quasi-periodic potential in a particular way with this matrix beta mu nu playing the role of the irrational number, uh, playing the same role that the irrational number does in one dimension. And the matrix has a particular form in terms of cosine and sine functions of some angle. So in two dimensions, the matrix is a two by two matrix. In three dimensions, it's a three by three matrix. And it has a certain structure, okay? And so if you have an irrational number B, which is sitting here, and you choose some 
angle, then at least in the thermodynamic limit, you're assured that the potential doesn't repeat itself. But the choice of the angle still has to be done judiciously so that the potentials don't get too close to one another for a finite size system. So there's some technical issues related to that, which I won't go into. But anyway, the important thing is this is what the potential looks like. So what we can do is we can go ahead and do exactly the same analysis in two and three dimensions that we did in one dimension. Uh, look for the conductance of the function of system size and look for single parameter scaling. So this is what we see in two dimensions, okay? So this is uh, log g as a function of log l <clears throat> and for different values of v, okay? So above the transition, at the transition and below the transition. And so once again, you have localized uh, behavior below the transition and you have as opposed to ballistic behavior now in two dimensions super diffusive behavior above the transition and exactly at the transition it appears that you have sub diffusive behavior I should have mentioned that even in the 1D case if you look at the zoo of exponents that you get they seem to be consistent with sub diffusive behavior all of them so even in 2D uh, in, at the critical point <clears throat> we seem to get sub diffusive behavior okay as far as single parameter scaling is concerned, if you look at beta as a function of g, so once again, it appears that you have a violation of single parameter scaling in 2D at the transition, okay? But I should also point you to this paper, which claims the opposite, looking at wave functions rather than the conductance. So there is still an issue here to be resolved about whether there is indeed violation of single parameter scaling and whether that depends on the particular quantity that you're looking at, but this is what we observe. Now, in three dimensions, this is what we get. So this is again log g as a function of log l, okay? And um, so here we are looking at the transition from the localized to the diffusive system. So as I told you, in three dimensions, there are two transitions. So you have the localized phase, a diffusive phase, and a ballistic phase. So here we are focusing on the transition from the localized phase to the diffusive phase. And we do actually get exponents, you know, if you look at the, the dependence of G on system size, we actually do get exponents which are consistent with diffusive behavior above the transition and localized behavior below the transition, okay? And if you look at beta as a function of G, if you look at the beta function as a function of G, as opposed to one dimension and two dimension, here it looks like you actually do have single parameter scaling which holds reasonably well, meaning that you don't see any violation of single parameter scaling at the critical point. Uh, I mean, these gaps here are just because of, you know, what kind of system sizes we can go to and what values of G are allowed. So, you know, so, so these are not really indicative of any violation of single parameter scaling. So it looks like you have a reasonably smooth beta as a function of G, okay, across this localized diffusive to um, localized to diffusive transition. And you also have a scaling collapse of G as a function of L, from which you can extract this critical exponent nu, which is the localization length critical exponent. And it is indeed the same as for the 3D universality class, as also seen in the previous work from a different analysis. So in three dimensions, it does appear A, that you get the same exponent as you do for the Anderson universality class, and also that you have single parameter scaling, that both of these things go hand in hand, okay? Um, so what I should mention is that we haven't been able to observe in from our numerics the second transition, which is from the diffusive to the ballistic phase. But one reason for that could be that, you know, the numerical results that I showed you were really for the open system conductance in 3D. We don't, we're not able to do the calculations as efficiently for the Thaulis conductance. So we've been doing it for the Kubo conductance. And so the moment you connect leads, the duality of the model is destroyed. The duality which assured you that there were two transitions which were in the same universality class. So the fact that we don't observe the second transition could very well have to do with our altering the geometry, uh, which actually gives you these two transitions. But this is what we see in 3D, okay? And again, at the critical point, even here in 3D, we actually see, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> sub-diffusive behavior like we do for the, the one and two dimensional models. So let me just conclude with that. So what we've done is we've looked at whether single parameter scaling holds uh, for, the, for the metal insulator transition in these quasi-periodic models. And what we find from our numerics is that there's a violation of single parameter scaling in 1D and 2D. And there's approximate, so why do I say approximate? Because the one thing which I glossed over was that there are still fluctuations over the smooth beta of G behavior. 
So the single parameter scaling that we see in some sense is averaged over the fluctuation. So in that sense, it is still approximal. But to within that average, there seems to be single parameter scaling in 3D, but not in 1D and 2D. And so in 1D and 2D, a single parameter scaling fails very dramatically in the vicinity of the critical point, but that doesn't happen in 3D. And in all three of these dimensions, if you ask what is the nature of transport exactly at the critical point, it appears that it is subdiffusive. Okay. Thank you. Questions and comments? I think there's a question there at the back. So how general are the results for other kinds of quasi-periodic potentials? Sorry, can you, can you just... Uh... Okay, so, so, right, so that's a good point. So the thing is that, as I said, what is special about this particular kind, these kinds of quasi-periodic potentials is that you have this duality. So there is no single particle mobility edge, okay? So the moment you look at any other kind of quasi-periodic potential, the sort that you're talking about, the generic situation would be that you have a single particle mobility edge. And so what happens then um, as you go across the mobility edge? So instead of, say, tuning the strength of the potential, you could actually just change the energy that you're looking at. And so when you're sitting at the mobility edge and at the critical point, you know, what happens is something which we haven't looked at. But that's an interesting question. Uh, also, I should mention that in two and three dimensions, I don't think anyone has really looked at these models where you don't have this duality. I mean, it's only the models with the dualities which have been studied. So that would be an interesting thing to study. But in one, in 1D, you know, it's been clearly established as a mobility edge, and one can in principle do this, but we haven't done it. Probably miss something basic. Sorry, uh, can you just speak without the mic and louder? Okay, uh, let me just go back to that slide. Got the phase diagram somewhere. Okay, so this is their phase diagram. Okay. So unlike in the 1D case, here you also have a diffusive phase in between. In 1D, what would happen is you'd go straight from localized to ballistic. Here there's a diffusive phase. Okay? So the way that they arrive at this is the following. So they're actually looking at energy level spacing statistics. So the R that you see here is energy level spacing statistics. And so they see that you, you, you know, there's Wigner Dyson statistics in this regime. And so they conclude that this is diffusive. Now for the regular Aubrey Andre model, whether you're looking at the localized side or the delocalized side, you will see Poisson statistics and not Wigner Dyson statistics because of this duality. And the same thing happens here. The localized phase here is related to the ballistic phase through this duality. And so you see Poissonian statistics here. But because in between you see this regime with different statistics, Wigner Dyson, they conclude that it's diffusive. It's a non interacting but, but, you know, that's why, because even in the Anderson model in 3D, right? So on the delocalized phase is a diffusive phase, even though it's non-interactive. A related question. What if you just calculate IPR across this diagram, across this uh, thing? You can use IPR to get the same uh, phase diagram? Well, okay. So, At least the localized and ballistic well, you think, can get. Okay, so, right? so I think the problem would be that uh, if you use IPR, and you want to distinguish between the ballistic and the diffusive phase. Okay, so the IPR phase will clearly, IPR will clearly tell you what is localized and what is not localized. Okay, uh, but then the thing which is not localized, whether it is ballistic or diffusive, right? Uh, I don't know whether what you would actually look for in the IPR in terms of the scaling of the IPR. Is in the 1D case, uh, the ballistic, diffusive, and critical point is completely characterized by IPR, right? No, but in the 1D, what was diffusive in the 1D case for a non-interacting system? The critical point in the 1D case. Yeah, yeah. But the, right. But the critical point is not really diffusive, right? I just it, It's sub-diffusive. That's true. Just to make the... Right. No, so to, I think, I think to, the point here is that because, you know, ballistic versus diffusive, um, so 
Maybe there is something in the IPR which would tell you that these are different. But at least the simplest application of the IPR would tell you that you know something is localized versus something is not localized. And whether that not localized thing is, is ballistic or diffusive would probably require some additional. Sorry? Right, so exactly. So you can look at the spread, you can look at the spread of the wave function. You could actually look at spread of wave packets, which would be a more efficient thing, which is sort of what these people have also done here. So you start with a wave packet, right? And you just see how the wave packet changes as a function of time. And that would give you, that would tell you whether it's ballistic or diffusive. So that's another way in which you can distinguish between these two kinds of states, but that's not quite the IPR. I mean, that's some dynamics which you're, uh, There's no direct transition from diffusive to ballistic in the open system context. Right, that means so you continue seeing diffusive. Well, actually, so here's the thing, right? Um, so, so uh, right. So what we see actually it turns out in the numerics, and Jagannath can maybe. So we actually see some super ballist. What do we? Yeah. So we actually see something which completely messes up the numerics once you get to this regime. We seem to see transport with a super ballistic, which doesn't make any sense. Meaning that if you're looking at G, right. So that's saying that clearly something is going wrong there, okay? And, and, it, and, and the fact that it gets messed up presumably has to do with the fact that we have messed with the duality by connecting leads. So, so that, that was, sorry? Hmm? No, we haven't done wave packet spreading. We haven't done, no, but these people have. So the wave packet spreading, so, you know, right. So they've already looked at wave packet spreading. They've looked at wave packet spreading and they have also looked at a version of the IPR, which is where you look at what the wave function looks like as a function of real space, except that instead of calculating the IPR, they've done something more. They've actually gone and done a multifractal analysis of that, okay? And from the multi, but, but they've used that to get this critical exponent. So, so they haven't actually extended that into the ballistic phase. So again, you know, their IPR-like analysis was to distinguish between localized and diffusive, not this other thing. So they use duality to say that the same transition should exist here, but without doing the IPR analysis. Last quick question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>